Welcome to 60 Skills. Today's topic is meditation on Pluto. Meditation on Pluto is a rarely covered topic, mainly because as the furthest out of the outer planets, most people just don't have a reason to go there. Now, some things to know about this is that as the last of the planets in our solar system, it also is kind of a buffer zone between what exists inside the solar system and what exists outside the solar system. As such, it can safely be said to be the last planet that has any real physical effects, if you will, upon a practitioner, as everything beyond that is simply beyond the scope of human development at this time. All right, what are some characteristics of meditating upon Pluto? Well, first, you're not going to find any spirit registries of entities to contact. So if you're going to do this kind of work, you're going to have to do the path working yourself. An additional challenge that I found working with these entities is that, uh, to quote one of them, we don't do sigils here. It was really quite interesting. The simple fact of the matter is, these entities, whatever they're up to, don't really care that much about living human beings, and I will get to that in a moment. So you're dealing with a place with no known spirit registers. You're dealing with a place where finding sigils for any of the inhabitants is going to be a bit rare. Now, the color associated with this, as outlined in Franz Barden's second book, Magical Evocation, is a gray color. Now, this is also interesting because Pluto, astrologically speaking, is actually a further refinement of Mars. Some would also say Saturn. So, it is also, from what I've gathered in both experience and research, a further refinement of your physical body is what you get from this. However, for a very specific reason that requires addressing in a moment. So amongst the outer planets, you have Uranus, you have Neptune, and you have Pluto. Uranus causes a further refinement of the mental body. Neptune causes a further refinement of the astral body. Pluto, on the other hand, causes a further refinement of the physical body. Now, it does this through the medium of rejuvenation. So, a lot of the allegorical stories, if you will, of someone dying and be re being reborn are deeply rooted in Plutonian mythos. It results in a kind of rejuvenation via destruction. So, the process of getting that rejuvenation can be quite rough. And as a practical matter, if you have not worked through Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune in that order, do not go to Pluto. This is a very bad idea. Now, why are the spirits not that concerned with living entities? Well, as one of them very directly related to me, we don't really care because you're all ending up here anyway. One of the interesting things about Pluto, if you've read the stories of classical Greek Hades, is it is not a place of punishment like Saturn. It is, however, where the astral emanations of human beings, when they die, go to when they become energy depleted. So this is interesting. And it's interesting because this is where you get into the issue of necromancy, or working with the souls of the dead. As is commonly understood in meditative circles, while your mental body largely reincarnates, your astral body actually dies after a set period of time. But where does this go? Well, it turns out Pluto happens to be one of those places. So what you're going to find if you go there are the former emanations of living individuals that are in a kind of topor or sleeping state. They're not really gone, they just can't do anything because they don't have any energy off of which to act. So by recharging them, you can end up interacting with them, and this is where the study of necromancy comes from. So, okay, that's the mechanistic issue of what Pluto does. What else goes on at Pluto? Well, for one, Pluto is known as the kingdom of hidden riches. So when you go there, most of the stuff you tend to run into is, in fact, underground. And there's quite a bit of it. It is also the residing place of ancient magics. Also very important. So those are some basic concepts as to what goes on there. 
but let's get a little bit more into how things work with the entities there. Now, as I mentioned earlier, to engage this planetary sphere, you're going to have to engage in path working. Simply put, you're going to have to project your consciousness into Pluto, travel there, and meet some of the entities involved. What you get is going to be highly contingent upon the work you've done as a human being. And again, let me be clear, if you don't have command of your own Akasha, non-dual light, don't go doing this. It's a really bad idea. Now, the issue of rejuvenation is another curious one. So in addition to being the home of hidden treasures, and in some cases great wealth, it is also the home of rites of rejuvenation in addition to traditional magics. So, but there are rites of rejuvenation that come through a radical restructuring of the individual. Literally, you have to die in order to go through it. So again, not a trip to be cavalierly taken. Now, one of the interesting aspects of Pluto being related to, again, Mars, as a further attunement of that, is this issue of intensity. When you engage Plutonian energies, they are quite intense. And as a representation of this, its animal representation is naturally the phoenix, something that dies and is reborn from the flames over and over again. That is, by definition, a rather intense process. Pluto was interesting because most of the entities there really weren't that interested in me. And it was the only time that it ever was talking to an entity. And then it said, hey, you know what? I got to get back to work. I'll see you around later. So that was really an interesting experience. While I got a lot of imagery that was when I was there and it was very clear, what I did not get were any sigils. And so your work with this is probably going to take a while. Now, the reason why I mention all of this the way I did is this is one of my initial path working experiences. I simply don't have much experience with Pluto, and I certainly haven't gone through the physical refinement that they refer to in that system. But I mention this because it's an interesting learning experience. And too often when people come to 60 Skills or other teachers of esoterica, they come there with the expectation that their teacher knows everything there is to know about a given topic. And the simple fact of the matter is, that's frequently completely untrue. So I wanted to make this recording so that you out there can see what it's like as someone is working through the process of charting some relatively uncharted territory, to say the least. So, uh, if you liked today's lecture, please hit the subscribe button and the like button down below. And if you'd like to learn more about the 60 Skills curriculum, please look at the links contained in the details down below. Otherwise, have a great day and be well.